From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. I'm Joe Matthew along with Emily Wilkins, and we are in for David Weston. It's good to see you in New York. I know. Here Made it to are. the top of the Amtrak corridor for this important broadcast. Emily, we're going to be talking today about triage. That's where my mind is right now as we keep an eye on what's happening in Washington, D.C. with a to-do list as lawmakers come back to town tonight. No one knows this more than you. A to-do list that is daunting and not likely to get done, at least everything before the end of the year. So now it's time to start making the hard decisions. What do we leave on the cutting room floor and what can actually be passed by the end of this year. That's right. And one thing that lawmakers absolutely need to start focusing on this week is that debt limit, the debt ceiling. We've been here before. Democrats said that, you know, they got Republicans to come along with them once, yeah. but Mitch McConnell has promised that will not happen again. And so a debate right now is going on in D.C. trying to figure out how can they move this? Can they get some sort of bipartisanship if they pass it along with a larger defense authorization bill? So the couple of different menu options here in dealing with this, right? Then uh, first, for starters, we don't know exactly when a default would take place. Remember, it was at first supposed to be last Friday. Everybody circled December 3rd on their calendars at one point. Now we're talking about what, maybe the, the middle of December toward the end of January. What are your sources telling you? Well, everyone's still thinking about that December 15th number that Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen put forward. Granted, we've seen some estimates that have said that the U.S. government might be able to pay its debts for a little bit longer. But lawmakers don't want to mess around with this. Mm -hmm. Even though they tend to play a lot of politics, they do understand the really severe consequences of passing this debt limit and having the U.S. not able to pay its dues. Yeah, so let me do this. We can add a couple more. The National Defense Authorization Act, this little thing called reconciliation, uh, <laughs> the Build Back Better plan. We're coming up on the holidays with a lot to talk about. We can also add something called Omicron. Of course, we've got a new variant that is, of course, bringing up a lot of questions that we can't answer because there's no data yet. But with that uncertainty, we have a conversation now with Tyler Goodspeed, who's joining us Hoover Institution fellow, former acting chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. It's great to have you with us, sir. You were helping to advise the Trump administration in the economic response to COVID. In a, in a period of time that had even greater uh, uncertainty, there wasn't even a vaccine at the beginning of the process when you were looking at the possibilities out there and the risks facing our economy. With everything that Emily and I just said, you add now this new Omicron variant with data that has yet to emerge. Tyler, is the Biden administration doing the right things in this vacuum of information as we wait to learn more? Well, it's good to be with you, Joe and Emily. I can't speak so much to the public health aspect of the response, but certainly on the economic side, I can yes. say that I don't think that they are taking the right steps because on balance, to me, I see Omicron as, as more of a supply side shock than a demand side shock, even though it might have some negative impact on demand. It is certainly going to have uh, an adverse impact on the return to work. And I think that is going to complicate a lot of these supply side issues that we've been facing. And that will keep the inflationary pressure quite elevated as we head into 2022. You know, Tyler, we don't have a lot of data yet on the Omicron variant, but we are starting to learn a couple things about it. We understand that at this point that it's very transmissible, but that it's not perhaps as severe as other forms and other variants have been. What sort of impact, if those things play out in the research and the data that we're going to get, what sort of impact is that going to have on the economy to have a dominant variant that's very transmissible, but perhaps not as severe? So it would, it's certainly what we hope for, that it, that it becomes less severe. And that would certainly be in keeping with the typical pattern for these things is that over time they evolve to be more transmissible but less, less uh, severe. And they eventually become endemic in the community. Uh, in, in the near term, I think that so long as we don't know much about this, it is probably going to have, as I said, an adverse impact on the return to work. It's going to continue to complicate things for, for households who have children in school. 
1.1 million American households reported back in October that an adult in their household didn't look for work in the past month because of, of, of COVID. So I think that there are still going to be a lot of supply side complications coming out yeah. of this thing in the well, near term. It should be no wonder that we're talking about mandates, Tyler, and I'd like to, to get your input on them. The argument over mandates, and, and in some cases, Republican opposition to it, specifically last week almost interfered with a, a government funding uh, resolution, a continuing resolution, as you know, on Capitol Hill. And it appears there'll be a standalone vote this week on President Biden's vaccine and testing mandates. Where are you on this? Are mandates required to get people back to work, either by making them more comfortable or simply by protecting them? So I have heard the argument that if we get greater vaccine coverage through mandates, then that's going to facilitate uh, yeah. an economic recovery, a labor market recovery. I think on the other hand, you have the fact that a lot of people for, for very personal reasons, for, for health reasons, uh, they do not want to, to get vaccinated. And I think that when you look at the numbers involved, uh, these mandates could be complicating on net, could be complicating the, the, the labor market recovery by uh, affecting a lot of workers who say that they, they will not go to work if they are if they're covered or required to get uh, one of these one, uh, vaccines under the, one of these mandates. So you're worried that mandates keep more people away than draw more people back to work by making them feel safe. Correct. Tyler, I want to take sort of just the wide view here, wondering why you think that we haven't seen more Americans return to work at this point. Is it all about the pandemic or are there other factors here? So as I said, there are about 1.1 million uh, households who report that an adult didn't look for work because of, of uh, school closures or school issues. About 1.5 million Americans, by my estimation, have taken early retirement. Uh, 1.1, 1.2 million Americans report that they didn't look for work in the past month because of the pandemic, and that covers all sorts of reasons. But I think that there's also the fact that for, for most of this year, the federal government was paying people a premium not to work. Since this summer, the federal government has been paying uh, households with children a very large expansion of the child tax credit without work requ requirements. And then we, we had a big round of stimulus checks that, that most of which went into excess savings. And so I think that people are, are mm. a feeling that they can be a little bit more selective in terms of returning to work. Tyler Goodspeed, play triage with us for a moment. That's how we started this hour, looking at this massive to-do list in Washington. As you well know, the debt ceiling needs to be handled in the next couple of days before the market starts to get really upset about this. You've got the Biden agenda. You've got the National Defense Authorization Act. You know how this works in the halls of Congress. What needs to get done? What should be left on the floor? Well, certainly we do need to have... Uh, resolution of the debt ceiling issue. I think uh, a default would be would be really uh, a terrible economically for the country. I don't see it happening uh, in terms of whether it's going to be achieved by a reconciliation package, standalone reconciliation package done by the Democrats, or whether there's some sort of deal. I don't know about the politics. My hunch is that there probably will be some sort of deal. Uh, it, I, I struggle to see, I increasingly struggle to see the reconciliation bill getting over the finish line before yeah. the end of the year, although that is certainly uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's objective. Um, personally, I wouldn't mind to, to see it uh, quiet, quietly, uh, quietly expire. <laughs> I thought you might say that. You know, another thing we have coming up this week, we do have the latest inflation data, those CPI numbers coming out. Tyler, what are you going to be watching for there? So I'm going to be watching for what's happening to rent. I'm going to be watching for how broad base the inflationary pressure is. Because a few months ago, we heard a lot of people say, even when we had these high inflation reads, they would say, oh, well, if you, if you exclude this, if you exclude used cars, new cars, if you look at the trimmed mean or you look at the 16% uh, trimmed mean, then it looks that it's, you know, it's not that bad. But increasingly, when you use those same measures, uh, in recent months, the inflationary pressure has actually been worse than it was back in, in, in April, May, June of earlier this year. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be paying attention to how broad-based a lot of the, the, these inflation reads are and also what's happening to real wages. Do you trust Jay Powell to take care of this inflation issue, Tyler? I, I know Jay Powell. I think he's a great guy, and uh, I, I think he is aware of the, the inflationary pressure, and I think he's attentive to the risk now. 
Um, I do worry that the Fed has been slow to act and therefore may have to act more aggressively than otherwise would have been the case because these inflationary pressures have been building and expectations have, have risen as a result. Yeah. Well, thanks to Tyler Goodspeed of the Hoover Institution. Coming up, our interview with New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu, his thoughts on vaccine mandates and why he's not running for the Senate. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. I'm Joe Matthew, along with Emily Wilkins. We're in for David Weston today. Thanks for joining us now for Bloomberg First Word News. We go to Mark Crumpton. Mark? Joe, thank you. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov is warning against high hopes for tomorrow's video conference between Presidents Putin and Biden. The Russian military buildup near Ukraine is expected to top the agenda, and the Russian state news agency TASS says that President Putin will, quote, listen with great interest, end quote. The White House says that President Biden will reaffirm U.S. support for Ukraine's sovereignty. The U.S. and the U.K. will push to remove Trump-era tariffs on British steel and aluminum. U.K. Trade Secretary Anne-Marie Tevlian meets Tuesday with U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. The tariffs are a headache for Prime Minister Boris Johnson. He said that improved trade relations with the U.S. would be one of the major benefits of leaving the European Union. Olaf Scholz has cleared the final hurdle on his path to becoming Chancellor of Germany. Green Party members have approved their coalition deal with Scholz's center-left Social Democrats and the pro-business Free Democrats. Their agenda is said to include a focus on climate and plans to upgrade Germany's technology infrastructure. Researchers say the fact that the Omicron variant has a large number of mutations on the scene that helps COVID-19 spread may provide clues as to how it developed. That's according to a group led by a scientist at the University of Cape Town. One theory says the strain emerged from an area where people have little access to health care. The variant could have developed in an immunosuppressed person who harbored the virus for a long time, allowing it to mutate. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Joe? Mark, thank you. Emily Wilkins, it was a big deal when we learned, what, just last week that Governor Chris Sununu of New Hampshire, Republican legacy in New England, was not going to be running for Senate. My question is, did you learn like everybody else by watching the announcement on the news? I mean, a lot of people learned like that. He did yeah. not go ahead and a give a lot of like Washington a heads up. And they're not happy about it. No. I mean, Chris Sununu was supposed to be a golden candidate. He was supposed to deliver New Hampshire to them. Uh, taking back to the Senate has gotten a lot harder now that he's decided not to run. Well, we wanted to ask him about that and, and some of the other issues that are making news in New Hampshire. He joins us from Concord, New Hampshire, as we spoke earlier with Governor Chris Sununu. And I started by asking him if Washington is broken. No, it's not broken. It's not. There's a couple things there. First, you have to have the right personality and skill set for it. I'm a CEO. I'm a manager. I'm a governor. And especially, I think I speak for most all governors uh, that have come through at least the last couple of years with the pandemic. Um, you know, we make 12 to 20 major decisions a day as governor. Impactful decisions, redesigning systems, getting results, accountability, metrics, all those kind of good things. Uh, that just doesn't happen in Washington. So one is, you know, there's a skill set around being a legislator and talking about policy and funding, but that's really where it ends. They don't really have to implement anything. As governors, we do. I love doing it. I, it's one of the most challenging things I could ever imagine doing, but also one of the most fulfilling, and I think we're doing it pretty darn well. So mm -hmm. it's just the biggest one is a fundamental difference in skill sets, if you will. And then there's a difference in time. Yeah, my, my brother was a former senator, um, you know, back in the olden days of the early 2000s, but it's also a very different time there. And, and the partisanship um, is is getting, it's not, doesn't mean it's broken, but I think you have a lot of personalities down there are that are more focused on their personalities and the partisanship of it, as opposed to, look, 
look, we got to get stuff done, right? 330 million Americans are expecting and waiting for us to move the ball forward and get stuff done. And when that doesn't happen or it happens, you know, once a month, basically, <laughs> and there's frustration. And, and I sure. just, uh, that I would be incredibly frustrated. And not only would I be frustrated, but they'd probably ultimately get pretty frustrated with me because I, I could be pretty demanding about accountability and results as, I mean, people are electing and hiring me to do a job. And so I always feel that obligation to, to show the results, show the accountability, show where it's working, sure. show where it's not working. Sometimes sure. it doesn't work, right? That's okay. Sure. Well, Governor, you know, there is still a Senate race coming up in 2022 in New Hampshire. Who would you like to see from the Republican Party take on Democratic Senator Maggie Hassan? Almost anybody can beat Senator Hassan at this point in New Hampshire. Uh, her poll numbers are that bad. She, uh, she doesn't appear in this state. And so, unfortunately, uh, we just haven't had that right kind of representation. And people in New Hampshire are very engaged politically, as you know, with our first of the nation primary, our local politics, our town meetings. It all really co coalesces to a very engaged electorate. And therefore, uh, if you're not producing results, uh, they just want somebody new. Uh, and often that is more important than party. So I think there's a lot of Republicans here that could take on. And that's another part of my equation. It wasn't just oh, only Chris Sununu can beat uh, Senator Hassan. Not at all. I think there's three or four decent Republicans. I think you're going to have a very robust primary here. And at the end of the day, I think you're going to see a Republican sitting in that seat in about a year. Well, I have to ask you about COVID, uh, Governor. I know that New Hampshire is one of four states in the country seeing the highest increases, the biggest rises in cases right now. It's something that you refer to as a very severe winter surge. And this is starting to bring back some bad memories. We're not even talking Omicron right now. Now, this is Delta, right? This is old fashioned COVID, if we can call it that by now. I wonder how concerned you are about the winter and whether you have the hospital beds to deal with this. Uh, we've been concerned for months. So uh, I've been predicting the winter surge for the last six months. Um, back in September, when our numbers were really low, I took a whole team to Kentucky, for example. We flew to Kentucky, met with hospitals, met with the governor specifically about how they were dealing with the surge. Back in the summer, you saw surges in Florida, Mississippi, Kentucky, all across the country. New England was a bit uh, held off from that. Um, we had great weather. Folks were outside. You know, we had a really strong summer here yeah. across New England. But again, given the seasonality of this pandemic, I always knew that it was going to come. So the good news is we've prepared. We've looked at uh, flexing our internal surge capacities within hospitals, how we can fast track licensing to make sure no one is waiting to become a nurse, that they're getting streamlined right into the system so they can work on those floors. Making sure a big piece of this is that individuals who might be in an emergency room that are waiting for a bed in a long-term care center or a rehab center, they're being moved out as quickly as possible. And, and that's one of the biggest backlogs, if you will, that causes hospitals across this country to jam up. Folks are waiting to go to the, their, another place. So mm -hmm. we fast track that process here in New Hampshire. And then we have a lot of money going out. We're, we're hiring strike teams. So as it's 75 and sunny in Florida, you know, people's immune systems are stronger. Their hospitals aren't nearly as overwhelmed, kind of like we were in the summer. So we're hiring strike teams from other parts of the country where COVID isn't rearing its ugly head as, as strong as we knew it was going to be here, bringing some of those individuals in to help supply uh, long-term care facilities or hospitals. So we've got a lot going on. And then obviously the big one is testing, uh, making sure that folks aren't going to emergency rooms or you know uh, clinics for their tests. They can do them right in their own homes and creating that home opportunity for testing is really important. And we're very proud of some of the programs we've put into place, kind of leading the country with you know a million home tests hitting the market excuse me, hitting the market over the next week. <clears throat> well, Governor, the big debate here down in Washington, D.C., is over these vaccine mandates that President Biden has tried to implement. Do you think that there is a role at all for mandates as uh, states like yours try to combat COVID-19 and the new Omicron variant? Not in terms of a government mandate. You know, when the government starts mandating certain health care procedures, uh, that crosses a line. It really does. It does have to be the individual responsibility. Now, we want everyone to get vaccinated. I'm as pro-vaccine as they come. I'm out there every day doing commercials and encouraging it. But at the end of the day, that is a very personal family decision. And we want everyone to make the right decision, which is to get vaccinated, whether it's your kids, whether it's your coworkers, whatever it might be. So the government forcing that, um, it's, it's not the right answer. And even the Biden administration, administration for months and months and months. The first half of the year was very clear. The government was not going to mandate. The government was not going to mandate. And then uh, in about a week, they did a 180 degree turn. Uh, I think it was very, very much a political decision. And they said, well, we're just going to mandate everything. But again, 
if I may, it's a great example of Washington being caught in a bubble without any real connection about what's happening on the ground, what's happening with businesses and families, yeah. and the impacts, the uh, the negative aspects of the impacts of mandating a vaccine like that. Just to so put a finer look, point a on it, Governor, model, just to make sure yeah. I understand you, because you seem to have a pretty conservative approach to this. It's not that you oppose mandates. You just want private enterprise to decide whether they will impose them or not, as opposed to the government. Do I understand you right? Yeah, because private enterprise has always had that power. I ran a business with 800 employees. If I wanted to impose a mandate or a vaccine or a hospital wants to impose a vaccine, that's been the law of the land for in, in their ability to do that forever. So, you know, one thing I, I see some other governors saying, well, we're going to make sure businesses can't mandate the vaccine. Well, you, that's an infringement on those businesses' rights, right? Let's take Fred's flower shop. Small family business. He's a flower shop. His kids work for him. He's got four or five employees. He's immunocompromised. He says, look, I, I want, I need everyone here to be vaccinated because to keep my business, my, my family business going. Yep. To the, for the government to come in on the other side and say, sorry, you can't do that. That's an infringement on their rights as well. So my, my stance on vaccines is very consistent. You can't, the government shouldn't be forcing a vaccine mandate and they shouldn't be also forcing businesses not to have that freedom and flexibility that they've always had, taking away that right. So um, I, I believe the best thing government can do when it comes to business is get out of the way, mm -hmm. let business do what they're going to do and empower them with the rights to do that. New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu joining us earlier from Concord where the stockings are hung. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power. I'm Emily Wilkins here with Joe Matthew. The SEC has launched investigations into two EV makers, Tesla and Lucid. Here with the details is our markets reporter, Kariti Gupta. Well, Emily, thank you. Let's just kick it off uh, with Tesla and Lucid intraday because they are both under pressure thanks to getting in the crosshairs with the SEC. Let's kick it off with Tesla in particular, though, down about 2% intraday. You got Lucid down about 7%. Tesla in particular dropping after the SEC opened an investigation into the company over whistleblower claims on solar panel defects. And of course, this is going to be a big deal because this is one of the heavy hitters in uh, the S&P 500. You can see dropping almost to a bear market. Lucid, a similar wow. story. This time, they're actually talking about investigation for uh, the company that they went into spacking with, uh, the Churchill Capital Organization. Yep. Remember, the SEC is looking at other EV makers as well. Something to watch as the day gets ahead, Emily. Thanks to Kriti Gupta. Coming up on Balance of Power, holidays are quickly approaching. COVID cases are on the rise. We're going to discuss the latest on mandates and testing with Dr. Daniel Roth, Trinity Health Chief Clinical Officer. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. Welcome to Balance of Power. I'm Joe Matthew along with Emily Wilkins today. We're in for David Weston for Bloomberg First Word News. Right now, we go to Mark Crumpton. Mark. Joe, thank you. Top U.S. infectious disease expert Dr. Anthony Fauci says President Biden's administration considers the ethical implications of its COVID-19 strategy more than Donald Trump's did. During a World Health Organization-led webcast today, Dr. Fauci said the Trump administration considered ethics when making decisions on COVID-19 only, quote, spottingly, in comparison with the Biden White House. The World Health Organization says the coronavirus pandemic has derailed the global campaign against malaria, which saw increased deaths from the mosquito-borne disease for the first time in three years. The agency says the number of malaria cases and deaths in 2020 were at least 40 percent higher than the group's target numbers. It's a blow for sub-Saharan Africa, which accounts for 95 percent of cases. The coronavirus pandemic has apparently led more millennials to prepare their wills. According to the Wall Street Journal, lawyers and financial advisors are hearing more from younger adults who want to get their affairs in order. The Senior Care Referral Service 
Caring.com says about 27% of 18 to 34 year olds had a will this year. That's up from 18% in 2019. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Emily? Thank you so much, Mark. Well, obviously, the world is still waiting to hear more data and more information about what we can expect with the Omicron variant. And, Joe, obviously, this is something that has really been coming to D.C. in a big way, mm -hmm. uh, not just with the variant itself. Uh, obviously, we saw President Biden have that travel ban in place, which now Dr. Fauci says they're potentially reconsidering. Yes. But it's also come into Congress with this huge question over vaccine mandate. Yeah, we guess we're going to get a standalone vote on uh, mandates this week. We, we did go through this last week with the, with the continuing resolution to fund the government, slowed things down at least. We'll see what happens with that vote this week, Emily. But I have to tell you, I wonder if we're talking about the wrong thing here sometimes. The numbers that we're seeing, as we discussed with Governor Sununu in New Hampshire, the numbers we're seeing in cold weather states from New Hampshire to Minnesota are deeply troubling. And this isn't Omicron we're talking about. This is Delta. Yeah, Delta is absolutely still the leading variant in yeah. the U.S. And to talk a little bit more about that, joining us now is Dr. Daniel Roth. He is the Trinity Health Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Dr. Roth, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm just going to go ahead and put Joe's question to you. Should we really be worried about the Omicron variant right now when we are seeing such high surges in various states of the Delta variant? Yes, thanks, Emily. And, and Emily and Joe, it's great to be with you. And, and I agree with you completely. Our focus today should be on really focusing on the Delta variant and the 100,000 cases every day in our country that we have. We've known for a long time these are the things that we can do to control it. We need to get everybody vaccinated who can be vaccinated. We need to get everybody boosted who's been vaccinated but hasn't been boosted yet. We need to wear masks mm -hmm. when we're indoors and in gatherings, consistent with the CDC guidelines. If we do those things, We'll make a dent in the 100,000 cases a day, that more than 1,000 people a day who are dying of COVID, much of which is preventable. Uh, and also will put us in a good stead. So if the Omicron variant does what we worry that it might do, which is become a more dominant strain or more transmissible strain, we'll be in a better position because all of those things assuredly will protect us from that. But to your point today, we have more than 1,000 deaths a day in the country. We have 1,200 people in hospitals across Trinity Health the overwhelming majority of which are unvaccinated, and all those would be preventable if we just did those things. And today. doctor, we're about to go indoors for another holiday celebration here again. I wonder, as you think back to last year, it, it was the incoming president, Joe Biden, who talked about the long, dark tunnel. What is this winter gonna look like? I don't think this winter should be and would be a long, dark tunnel. It, it is still with us and having our lives impacted by the pandemic, but not in that same way. I think much of what we can face today in this winter is under our control. We can have holiday gatherings. Everybody that can be vaccinated should be vaccinated in those gatherings. We have much more robust testing. And so if you're gonna have those gatherings, you can test people before you get together. Those things make those holiday events safer uh, and in so doing, make it far less dark. That being said, we do face a situation where all too often we're not doing those things. And we're facing that, especially here in the United States with case rates that are higher than we would like. Hmm. And I know that obviously one of the ways that public officials have tried to sort of conquer this is to try to put vaccine mandates in place, particularly uh, we saw President Biden try and put forward a mandate on companies with 100 or more employees. Uh, I'm wondering, doctor, do you think that these are a good way to go about getting people vaccinated? Or do you think that the blowback to some of these policies is ultimately going to create more complications? I think. For sure, first and foremost, getting as many people vaccinated as we can will always make us safer and improve our public health. We made the decision at Trinity Health back last summer to require the vaccination for our colleagues um, and caregivers. And we did that based on their safety, the safety of the people and the patients that we serve every day and their family members and the safety of our community. We feel like today more than ever, that was the right decision that helped to improve safety and help keep our communities safe and well. So we think in that case, it was a very good idea. The politics of that are complex. Um, I heard Governor Sununu, and I think uh, we would certainly advocate that having a consistent approach across the country would help us, help it less confusing for people. But ultimately, what's most important is getting many, many people vaccinated as can be.
I want to ask you about testing, Dr. Roth, because we don't talk yeah. about it enough, according to many who are concerned that we focus so much on vaccines. And of course, vaccines and now boosters are critically important to beating this. But, but turning away from testing has been the result in many cases. How important will it be to get short-term uh, short tests to people as the president has been asking private health insurers to start picking up the cost here so you can track COVID and, and prevent the spread? Yeah, we, we absolutely positively want to test more. It is not a replacement for vaccination, so let me be clear about that. It doesn't mean that you don't have to get vaccinated and then you can get tested before you go. Vaccination is still a safer way to go. It still will do a much better job in decreasing transmission and keeping people healthy. But that being said, when you can't be vaccinated or when you're going to be in a gathering and you are vaccinated, there is an added benefit to getting tested beforehand. We do that. I'll do that tonight before one of our meetings here at Trinity Health. I'll do that before my family gatherings uh, mm -hmm. this upcoming holiday season like we did on Thanksgiving. That's a way of keeping all of us that are vaccinated safer and helping us be more informed um, to minimize our exposure and our exposure to others. So testing is an important part of this. It's complementary to vaccination. Many thanks, Dr. Daniel Roth, Trinity Health Chief Clinical Officer, for sharing your insights with us today. Coming up, we head to Brussels for an important interview with Spain's finance minister. That's next, Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power. I'm Emily Wilkins here with Joe Matthew. Inflation pressure in Europe is likely to be temporary. That's the view from the president of Eurogroup, who spoke with us earlier. Now, let's go back to Brussels, where Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo is joined by another Eurogroup attendee. Maria, over to you. Thank you, Emily. We are joined now by the Spanish Finance Minister, of course, the Deputy Prime Minister uh, to Nadia Calviño. You're in Brussels today when there's a big discussion about inflation. Is this a one-off? Is it temporary? We know that the ECB is really stressing this line, saying this will cool down. But again, when you look at prices uh, and the way that this impacts people, it does look like perhaps this is here for longer. Well, everybody agrees that this is a temporary phenomenon. There is an element which is linked to the basis that we're comparing to. Of course, we're comparing with the prices in the thick of the pandemic in 2020. Also, the situation of labor markets and markets in general on both sides of the Atlantic, I think, is not comparable. So generally, the view is that this is temporary and we will see it coming down in the course of next year. And a lot of this also is pegged to the energy crisis that we're seeing in Europe. But this year, it's, it's very serious. I mean, it's not even winter, but we're seeing prices rocket every week. Do you attribute that to the gas supply? Do you attribute that perhaps to Russia, keeping that very, very tight? Is it renewable energy? That sounds great, but it's still not there yet. Indeed. Our main concern is not so much prices themselves or the numbers, you know, but rather what's happening in energy markets. And what we see is that there is an increase of prices in, in the gas market, and that is immediately translating into the wholesale market in Europe. And we see the situation, for example, in a country like Spain, where we have an important penetration of renewables. It is growing, but this is not transferring into the prices that citizens, that families, that companies pay, because also the functioning of European markets, electricity markets are, are marginal price uh, driven. And that means that the most expensive energy sets the price for all sources of energy. And so the fact that a big share of our mix is actually much cheaper is not passed on to families. And this is a source of concern. And, and it is also potentially a big uh, social problem. But, you know, there is a debate, particularly in energy markets, whether, you know, gas uh, puts you very much in the hands of uh, Vladimir Putin, Russia, perhaps nuclear should be the way to bridge the gap from brown to green. What's your take on that? Our approach is, is quite consistent with the idea that we want to have the cleanest and the cheapest energy as soon as possible, and we think that's renewables. In the case of Spain, it's more the North African gas that we're more dependent on. Algeria. Our, exactly. Our relationship with Algeria is excellent, and so we, we have a guaranteed supply of gas for the whole of the winter, and, 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 and that should not be a source of concern. But, but you don't worry about blackouts, because there have been reports potentially that in Europe we could see blackouts in the winter. No, that's not. A, we're not concerned at all about blackouts. The supply has been guaranteed very recently again. 
So, but our concern has more to do with the way our energy markets are regulated and they work, you know, because at the end of the day, if these lower prices for most of our energy mix are not passed on to citizens, they do not see the benefits of the Fit for 55, of the whole green transition. And I think it's very important that we bring citizens and corporates with us in this uh, unavoidable process. And you make a very good point because we just came out from COP and of course there was Greta Thunberg who kept saying, you know, this is blah, blah, blah. But a lot of the political world says it's blah, blah, blah. But if it's very expensive, you know, this blah, blah, blah could see a lot of people pushing away from the green uh, kind of revolution. Is that something that concerns you that you know, citizens look at the bill and they say, actually, green is not for me. Mm. Well, for the moment, we see a very strong commitment on the side of Spanish citizens. Uh, but uh, one should always be very, very much aware of the risk. You know, we need to be convincing. We need to be clear. We, ha we need to be coherent. We're very strongly committed to this green transition, but we need to make sure that it is fair and that citizens and companies see the benefits of these lower costs, cleaner energies. And, Minister, how much do you worry about the virus? We know that this is particularly a problem for Europe. This mm. is a magnet for tourists. We know that people love uh, coming to Europe. If this thing gets extended, and time, how much of an impact can it have, not just on the Spanish economy, but overall in, in the European one? Well, I hope it will not be very significant. Uh, for the moment, what we see in Spain is that uh, the tourist sector is picking up very fast. Uh, of course, the situation, the health situation in Spain is much better than mm -hmm. other European countries. Thanks to the speed and effectiveness of vaccination, we have 90% of the population vaccinated. And so, the, um, in the uh, impact uh, so far is much lower than in other neighboring countries. And I think that's given confidence to citizens that they can come to Spain. And our tourism sector is, is uh, booming. We just saw this uh, during the weekend where it's a, it's a national holiday today and all hotels, all restaurants, everything is full. I think people have much more confidence than one year ago that we can control the pandemic without uh, such a negative impact on our economy. And of course, I have to ask about Germany. Uh, your friend and colleague, Olaf Scholz, is now moving from finance minister to chancellor. Many see this as an opportunity, perhaps, on the fiscal space, but the f upcoming finance minister is known for being very hawkish in many ways. Uh, are you excited by this new German government, or do you worry, perhaps, about the direction that it's heading into? Well, no, I'm, I'm very excited about the new German government. I think Olaf Scholz played a key role in, in providing the European response to the pandemic. He is a, he's a, a, a great leader, and I'm very, very glad that he will be leading the German government. And I'm looking forward to meeting the new finance minister. He didn't join us in, Euro, in Eurogroup today, but I'm sure that very shortly we will be talking to each other and meeting each other. And I hope that he will be as important for the European project as Olaf Scholz has been in these past years. And just as a very final question that we always ask our European uh, guests, you know, we're seeing this vaccine mandate, you know, making this an obligation, not a personal choice. I know this is a very sensitive issue, but is that, would you say, valid? Is it legitimate? Or actually, you know, there are concerns that perhaps government trying to do a good thing is overstepping the line. Well, fortunately, we do not have this debate in Spain for the moment because the population is very conscientious about the need to get vaccinated. There's very strong solidarity. Also, family ties are very tight. And that means that everybody is getting a vaccine. And so we haven't seen the need to have this debate. Also, local governments and regional governments are competent for these kind of decisions. So right now, the process is one of maybe deciding on the vaccination pass in order to access mm -hmm. restaurants, uh, cinemas, etc. So far, we are able to keep uh, full activity, uh, very close to normality. And I hope we will, we will continue to have it so in the coming months. And this vaccination pass that is everywhere in Europe, mm -hmm. if you want to go into a restaurant, I know I have to use it pretty much every day. Uh, Nadia Calvino, thank you so much. Of course, uh, Spanish finance minister joining us uh, in Brussels. Joe? Many thanks to Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo. Fascinating conversation, Emily, that makes us uh, remember that inflation is a global story. While we obsess over it in Washington, this is a global story. But want to keep our focus on Europe here with tensions flaring over Ukraine in a very important meeting, another one tomorrow for President Biden, who's going to be in, a, in a, a Zoom meeting, if you will, a video conference with Vladimir Putin to warn him against invading Ukraine. The stakes could not be higher. This is just what, two weeks after a similar video style chat with President Xi of China, President Biden leaning into geopolitics here 
in, in the hopes of looking at, at least like he's staying ahead of this story here. I mean, I think the difference here, Joe, is that when President Biden came in, he said that his focus was going to be on China and yeah. be on Beijing. But with the buildup of troops that we've seen at the Russia-Ukraine border, that has had to change his priorities. He has had to now go ahead and address this. And it's unclear at this point exactly what the Biden administration will be putting forward. Mm -hmm. uh, Biden is going to say that he supports Ukraine, uh, that there could perhaps potentially be some diplomatic assistance here. But at this point, the U.S. has not committed to bringing any troops to the area. Great story on the terminal from Josh Wingrove. Nick Wadhams, it's not just Ukraine. Cybersecurity is going to be another big one. And I wonder if they make more news on some of the stories other than Ukraine, because it is so infrequent. These two get a chance to speak. Out. I mean, cybersecurity, that is always, always a big one. Well, coming up, we will be looking ahead to the week in politics with Bloomberg contributor Jeannie Shianzano. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power. I'm Joe Matthew, along with Emily Wilkins. We're in for David Weston today. And Emily, I'll tell you, we started this hour talking about the debt ceiling, the debt limit. Lawmakers need to deal with this within days. And I am just still amazed that at this point in time, we're not seeing the heartburn in the financial markets that we were last time around. We're creeping up on this thing. We could be a couple of weeks away, according to the Bipartisan Policy Center. They went for, what, the middle of December toward the end of January. It's like the cable guy window sometime between 1 and 5 o'clock. But at some point, that cable guy hopefully is going to show up. And at the moment, there's no plan to deal with this. There's not. And I mean, Congress has shown that the last time they waited until the very last minute, you had sort of the panic in the market. That's right. And now this time, the, the other key thing here, Joe, is that they can't just snap their fingers and get something done. This is really something that could potentially take a couple weeks mm -hmm. should Democrats decide that they are going to have to go through that reconciliation process. Well, joining us now to discuss a little further is Bloomberg contributor Jeannie Sean Zeno. Uh, Jeannie, I'll just start with, uh, start with you on the debt limit. What do you think is going to be happening here. What sense do you have for how this is going to go forward? First of all, it's great to see both of you escaping <laughs> Washington, D.C. and joining us in New York. It's so good to see you both in person. Good plan, everyone. Good plan. <laughs> um, you know, it is, I think, you know, my read is that the markets aren't reacting because like so many of us keep saying, there is no way they will allow this thing not to be lifted. And yet you look at recent politics and you wonder, can we mm. be so sure about that? I think the latest thinking is, as, as you know so well, that they may try to attach this to the NDAA and push it through that way. But that is a fraught process. They have to keep progressives in line. They have to also hope that they can keep some of those conservatives in line, particularly in the House. So that's going to be very difficult. And then to your point, Emily, should they decide to go to reconciliation, you wonder about the timing of that. Can they do it in the time they have remaining and hope that they don't come up to the debt ceiling? And let's not forget that it wasn't that many days ago that Janet Yellen warned about if they don't do this and do this now, how, how detrimental that will be for the U.S. economy and all of us. So they really have to get this done, and it's still unclear how they're going to do it. I don't know. I'm having deja vu. I feel like we had this conversation recently, Jeannie. And it's interesting because they keep telling us the leaders are speaking. Are we, you know, do we get a little Christmas gift? A little present at the end of the year? You know, I think they're speaking. I mean, the one good thing is we've heard Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell having conversations about that outside of the scope of the press and even some of their own members. So hopefully that's a good sign. Mm -hmm. But yes, they must do this before Christmas. What I don't think they're going to do before Christmas, and I'm sorry to say this to Joe Biden, is his build back better. I don't think that gets done. But at this point, given that they've averted a government shutdown, yeah. that, you know, they if they get the debt ceiling and the NDAA passed, that that's a pretty good way to end the year, and they've got to be at least somewhat content with getting those things done. Again, if those two, the debt ceiling and the NDAA, indeed pass in the next couple weeks. Well, Jeannie, one thing that we do want to touch on very quickly is the passing of former Senator Bob Dole, uh, someone who I understand that, you know, obviously a lot of people in Washington have stories of the senator. 
That's right. And, you know, a historic passing. We hope that I am hoping he is going to lie in state. And I think in particular his relationship with Elizabeth Dole, which reminds me a lot of John and Abigail Adams. So much to say about both of them. Many thanks, Bloomberg contributor Jeannie Shanzana. We have more coming up on our next hour. You want to do some radio? Let's do some radio. Fantastic. We'll remember Bob Dole with former Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle. This is Balance of Power.